Um, Steve is actually uh, off giving a paper um, at the, I think the College Art Association or something of that okay. nature. Um, Sounds fancy. It does sound fancy. It does sound fancy. <laughs> Um, but we have the great, great good fortune to have Patricia Gerido here as our special guest. Um, Patricia has been a lot of things. Um, mm -hmm. She is a veteran activist. She was a program officer at a multinational NGO. She now runs a consulting and coaching business for people in the nonprofits. Um, but how Pat and I first met, and it's been a long time, yeah. um, is around pop culture. Oh, wait, I forgot the most important thing about well, Patricia. Oh, that I am the proud board chair of the center. In other words, she's our boss. <laughs> uh, when we do things that are really stupid, she's like, no, that was really stupid. Actually, you can't do that. I don't uh, that. No, no. Sure. <laughs> um, but yeah, so we met at what, about 10 years ago? Yeah. yeah 10 years ago. Um, and we met around our two things our love for popular culture, mm -hmm. but also our um, understanding that there was more in popular culture that could actually be used for activism. So you were okay. running this group called Go Left at that time. Yeah. Um, and what did you see in pop culture that you found redeeming for the Left Project? Oh, so. I've loved pop culture all my life and also loved activism all my life and would always have to hide, <laughs> right, the one love um, from the other love. Um, but what always frustrated me was that there were so many lessons that I was getting from pop culture that I was finding helpful in my activism that um, I tried to share with people and it was this sense of you know, actually, this is a great resource that we have. This is a way of understanding the world that we live in, and it provides a context for us in our understanding that I wanted to pull more people into looking at pop culture and looking at strategies that they can use that could be influenced by pop culture. That was Go Left mission. So why pop culture? I mean, why, you know, sometimes here we learn from art theory. We mm -hmm. think in the past we learned from cognitive theory, social marketing, but like, what is why what's so special about popular culture? What's special about popular culture is that it's popular. Right? <laughs> it is right there. It's right there in the name. <laughs> right there in the name. Right the the point of it is that it is trying to reach right a mass um, of folks or even a specific niches now, right? Because that's how culture has popular culture has evolved is to get very specific niches. But uh, it is that sense of how do I reach out uh, beyond what I think is good or smart and get an audience to pull into and accept this as being worth their time. Yeah, and I think that's, that's kind of one of the odd benefits of living within a capitalist culture. <laughs> uh, you know, sorry, because the fact is... Not in a coffee. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> is that, you know... If something isn't popular, you will not see it the next season. Exactly. Um, it's not like you know the BBC, or it's not like PBS or state-run television, mm -hmm. where we're you know there's lots of documentaries on the mating habits of bees because it's super important for right. us. Right. The fact is, if it doesn't sell, if it doesn't reach this target market, it disappears. And right. So we can almost read it as like a map to popular desire. Right, and it's not about it being good or well done. It's is it popular? Is there an audience ready to listen to this right now? And that doesn't mean that it's not good. Right, no. it doesn't I mean, mean that either. I and mean, when we first approached um, Pat about doing this, she said definitely. Um, <laughs> one because it's you know it's it's what she does um, and what she has done, but two, um, you brought up the. Uh, an episode of Blackish that mm. happened recently, right? Right. Um, and so I think we're going to start with that. Now we have limited technology here, mm -hmm. um, unfortunately. We were trying to futz around before and just couldn't figure out how to do it well. So what's going to happen is Joe is going to put up a clip um, in a link for a clip. Oh, look at that. It's like magic. It's like magic. <laughs> um, and click on that. Watch. It's about two minutes. Yeah. Right? And then we'll come back, and I want to hear why you had to see this. Okay, great. Right.
All right. Okay. All the reports are done. Um, so, uh, okay. Incredibly moving. Yeah. Uh, really powerful. But what, what? Talk to me about what, what do you see in that, and why? What can artistic activists learn from, say, that? Scene? Right. Um, so what I saw in that, right, is that they were able in that entire episode. And if you haven't seen it, I would recommend watching the entire episode. That was just an incredible poignant clip, uh, but the entire episode is amazing, is that they were able to capture the mood, right? This is a very particular moment um, that we're all experiencing, um, and they were able to tap into that mood, and in this particular clip, brought an African-American perspective to a larger audience that was historical and relatable and just push the level. So for me, seeing that, I was like, oh, they're able to tap in to everything that we're feeling in, in terms of our, you know, disbelief, upset, um, fear, and bring us into a, a, a level of, and there's still more that you need to do. There's still more that you need to think about. And I love that juxtaposition and how they were able to use um, the the episode and the characters towards that end. Well, how much of it is also about the episode and the characters? Because, you know, mm -hmm. I watch Blackish every week, mm -hmm. and there's often themes about black life, but sometimes it's just about family. Life. <laughs> yes. um, or going to Disney World and basically yes. selling Disney World. Okay? <laughs> so, but is that part of it, that sometimes it's not that? I do I found that Disney episode hilarious, and I loved it for the just in your face. This is an ad for Disney. We're on ABC. Uh, this is how they pay their rent. Um, but I think it is that right for a show like that. In order to uh, deal with the hard issues that they deal with at times, not all the time, that they pay the rent mm -hmm. by you know giving us uh, those moments of levity. Mm -hmm. Well, and it's, but maybe it's not just paying the rent. It's also like why we take this so seriously from Dre is because we've seen him in other places. If he's yeah. just the angry black political man, exactly. right? Which, and we've seen that character yes. on, on television for about 40 years, right? Then it's like, oh, he's the angry black <laughs> political man. But the fact is he's not necessarily political. Right. Um, and then there's this moment, which is sort of this every person moment of where he's like, to the people around him, wake up. You know, this is what black experience is like. Right. But I know who he is because I've been watching him <laughs> exactly. this for a couple of years, right? <laughs> and I can relate to him. I'm not black, but I do have a family. Right. Right? And so I can relate to him on a bunch of different levels, and then boom, this goes in. Exactly. You know he's spent more money on Jordans than yeah. he has on Black Lives Matter. Exactly. Right? <laughs> exactly. And that kind of humanizes the, what's really pretty of a, a radical political critique. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now. I want to up the stakes a little bit. Okay. Okay. Because it's pretty easy to look at something like that and say, okay, well, this is great because what popular culture can do if the screenwriters are on your side. Right. If the production house is on your side. If you're a strong actor and you have a strong producer, you can slip in some pretty awesome politics. But that doesn't happen all the time. No. Right? No, it doesn't. It does not happen all the time. And the fact of the matter is, you know, Blackish is a pretty sort of liberal progressive show. Mm -hmm. right? Let's up the stakes a little bit. Okay. I, I want to see what we can do with Fast and Furious 7. Okay. Okay. For those of you that don't know, the Fast and Furious <laughs> franchise is one of the most popular movie franchises um, ever, ever. Uh, throughout <laughs> history, internationally. And <laughs> the seven gives that away. <laughs> <laughs> and now it's up to eight. And I'm actually, I'm wondering about what's going to happen. Um, well, I'm not going to blow the plot. <laughs> um, but in any case, so um, we, we've got a trailer for you. Two minute trailer, two and a half minute trailer. So watch the trailer. And I'm going to put Pat on the spot about what we can learn from Fast and Furious 7 as activists. Okay. See you in a few minutes.
All right, we're back. Pretty yes. wild, huh? <laughs> Jumping through the skyscrapers. I mean, come on. That was an adrenaline rush. That was an adrenaline rush. I mean, okay, so we got guns. We got bikinis. Bear, bikinis we got bear torsos. We got cars. Yeah. We got cars course. coming out of airplanes. <laughs> we got more guns. We got some explosions. <laughs> so the question is, easy with blackish, a little bit harder with fast with Yes. But we like the challenge here at the Center for Artistic <laughs> Activism. And in fact, part of our trainings, one of the things we do in our trainings is we have a cultural event. Mm -hmm. And when you tell a bunch of activists they're going on a cultural outing, they immediately think a poetry reading in defense of, you know, against mountaintop <laughs> removal yeah. or something of that nature, right? Um, and we always say, nope, that's not what we're doing. <laughs> we're doing something else. So. We took Iraq War veterans, uh, Iraq War veterans against the war, to a Cubs game in Chicago. Um, go Cubs! We, go Cubs! <laughs> we took sex workers in Ireland to go see a musical in Dublin. Um, we have, let's see, we took immigration activists in South Texas to a wax museum. Mm -hmm. um, we played Monopoly with faith-based social justice organizers. And I tell you, those priests and ministers are really, really vicious when it comes down to a monopoly. Um, and uh, when we were working with Muslim American groups um, that were working against uh, police surveillance and profiling, we took them to see Fast and Furious 6. And the next morning, what we do is we reflect upon this. Um, and we found a couple of theorists really useful in thinking mm -hmm. about, like, what do you do with pop culture? And so we're going to kind of go way back, give you a little bit of a, um, a little theory lesson here. Very short one. Um, with this dude, uh, a very stately man. His <laughs> uh, name was William James. He's an early philosopher and pragmatist. Mm -hmm. And he was giving a lecture to pacifist students right before World War I. And he said something really interesting. He said, look, um, war is coming. And if we're going to convince people that war is not a good idea, telling them it's not a good idea is not going to work. Okay? Yeah. We have to understand that people go to war and agree to war for all sorts of good reasons. They go to war for reasons of adventure, mm -hmm. for reasons of solidarity. Um, so you can wear mm -hmm. skirts and throw your friends <laughs> up into the air. Um, and like, you know, think about uh, today. You go yeah. because you need a job. Right. Uh, you want to get out of your town. You want to feel like a hero, whatever that means. Exactly. And so that there, there's a lot of good things that go into why people go to mm -hmm. war. The problem with war most of the time is not why people, like we're talking about individual soldiers, right, at this mm -hmm. point, why they want to join the military. It's what the military ends up doing, <laughs> which is the result of war is always death. Right. And so what William James said is, look, we've got to engage people where they are. We've got to figure out why they're doing what they're doing and then create what he calls a moral equivalent to war. And his idea was like, how do you create something which gives a sense of honor, solidarity, purpose, and so on and so forth, but actually does things like helps people out, right? right? Um, builds roads. Uh, and you can see bits of this, okay? It's like what Teach for America is about. It's what the Peace Corps is about. And it probably reached the, the, the sort of the greatest point during the Depression with the Civilian Conservation Corps, which was actually mm -hmm. run by the Army, but all of the state parks that you see around the entire nation were built during that time. And essentially, it got people out of the shitholes they were from, mm -hmm. it paid them a decent wage, they wore a uniform, but they actually built stuff as opposed to blew right. stuff up. Of course, later, they blew stuff up um, <laughs> in World War II. But the idea of that, that you can actually figure out why people are doing what they're doing. Mm -hmm. And then to use the language William James did, we can move the point. That is, right. attach that to a different activity. So that's what we're going to do with uh, Fast and Furious 7. <laughs> so, okay, that what possibly can we actually <laughs> resurrect from that? I mean, uh, I don't want to have anything to do with an activism about guns and explosions and cars. Right. And bikinis and big muscles. I mean, the bikinis and the big muscles. <laughs> I'll go there, okay? Okay. But so what, what can, why is Fast and Furious so popular 
other than those reasons. Okay, so I will admit that this is a hard one. I would rather actually do war than do Fast and Furious <laughs> 7. But in order to push myself, right, it is, you have this scenario, right? You have the over-the-top villain, yeah. right, that they come together, not as friends, but as a family. That's right. I don't have <laughs> friends. I, I have a family. family. I love the right? Diesel. I love the Diesel. <laughs> I got the biggest boy crush. Anyway. Right? And that is something, you know, as activists, we need to be looking at because that is such a common thread in popular culture and something that we need to be thinking about more. How are you building family? How are you building community? Uh, because those are things that people actually want to hear and see. So even as you're, you know, destroying whole cities in order to get the bad guy, if you're doing it as a family, if you're showing connection, that connects with an audience. Um, so family is the other big part of this, I think, is an important lesson and something that, you know, you're seeing that they're using there. Um, I think the gender roles, right, that change, which... Would, we would have not seen 15 years ago. You mean but, the bikinis? No, not the bikinis, but that that bikini world exists in the same world that Michelle Rodriguez right. lived in. And, right? and, and ass-kicking women. Exactly. So that is, you know, that it's actually that the team, the family, yeah. is has to have every people, right? The multiracial yeah. aspect of it. Well, that's what's right? so striking about this. It's the... One of the few places in the world in American pop culture where actually white people are in an extreme minority. Yes. The villains are often white, which is really <laughs> interesting. They often wear ties. Yeah. Right? Um, but the the band you're rooting for is like deeply multicultural and gendered. Right. Exactly. And so when they even use language like we're being hunted, right, it has that subtext of it. It's just like, yeah, we're group of people of color being hunted, right? Yeah, <laughs> so, yeah. And we're going to fight back, and yeah. we're going to show them what we have, right? Because uh, they're out-resourced, they're out, right? They're... Except for they're really boss <laughs> <cops>. <laughs> exactly. So they have to be smarter right. than the competition, right? And that is also an important uh, aspect, too. You know, how are you smarter than what, right? It's mm -hmm. just like, if you're just talking about how uh, the other side is, you know, better equipped, better at this, better at that. People want to hear how you're, you know, what are you bringing to the table? And that's what Fast and Furious 7 is great at, um, uh, is really looking at, you know, this, you know, bravado and the sense of, you know, the odds are, are stacked against us mm -hmm. and we're still going to go into this and kick some serious butt kick some serious i want to i want to see if anybody folk any folks out there um had some ideas too leslie says the nod to religion in the clip is pretty interesting yeah there's that moment where they're, <laughs> they're around the hands. table and they're holding hands yeah and it's, but it's not religion like a you know a minister or yeah. a mom like preaching mm -hmm. at you or something like that it's about around the family yes. and that sort of you know uh Solidarity. Right? Yeah. I mean, it's almost like the Last Supper. <laughs> just, just, just saying. <laughs> Which I guess that puts Vin Diesel in the Christ, Christ seat. Okay. Right. But I mean, there is something totally interesting. Is there any other folks out there? Um, anybody find anything in Fast and Furious Seven that we could actually draw upon and use for our own activist, artistic endeavors? Ma Mar Maria says, oh, hey, uh, the inventiveness and fearlessness is a positive. Mm. Yeah, the inventiveness, because they always yeah. get stuck in a place. Yeah. They do like a little MacGyver type thing. <laughs> and, like, I mean, I got to say, I've seen every Fast and Furious. Okay? <laughs> and so, not this oh, like... one, but earlier Fast and Furious, <laughs> they have to figure out, like, how to actually capture a car. Right. which is transporting something, right? And they do this incredibly complicating, like blowing stuff up under and things right. like that. So, and this sort of sense of just being out there. Todd says, the joy of putting on a serious face and having a mission. Oh, yes. That's good, Todd. I love that. Right, because purpose is yeah. the other thing that gravitates people. Yes. Uh, no, <laughs> that, that's totally right on, because I think one of the things that we like about action movies, right, mm -hmm. is there's... In this finite time, people have a real desire to do something mm. and do something incredibly meaningful with their life, right. right? 
And a lot of the time in life, we just kind of moving through life, right? Right. But what does politics offer people? You know, ideally, it doesn't just offer them long meetings. Mm -hmm. It doesn't <laughs> offer them sort of, you know, guilt and self-sacrifice. It gives purpose. It does. And it's like, I'm putting on my game face. I'm going out there and kicking some butt. Right. And that we have to start thinking about, like, yeah, how can we build a sense of this is urgency and purpose into our work, too. And exciting, right? Yeah. Because data entry isn't exactly like driving the car through yeah. a building. Yes. We need a little bit more car chases. <laughs> Well, we, we once took a bunch of program officers from Africa and Eastern Europe to Coney Island and had them ride the, um, the cyclone oh. as our cultural experience. And what they learned from it, because they were trying to figure out how to get good grants mm -hmm. from the people that granted, was the combination of safety and fear was what, it, was what the cyclone was all about. <laughs> and so they were going to have a fear quotient and a safety fear. And there's something about excitement, like how do we make everything we do really exciting? Yeah, okay. Yeah, blowing stuff up. Um, so t Joel's got something here. Solidarity, commitment, endurance. Yeah. I mean, it's yeah. I love endurance because that is right. It is a key um, for us as activists. It's like, how do you keep going? You know, especially when again, when the villains are getting smarter, when they have <laughs> when you get thrown out of a window, <laughs> landing on a car. Exactly. How do you keep going? Um, and it is right, and there con that connection, the solidarity, knowing that people have your back, right? That as you're sliding across the floor and you're shooting, right? That someone else is catching the other um, villains who are, you know, trying to shoot above you. That you actually have a team around you. Yeah, yeah. Now, I think something is important to also note, which is Fast and Furious franchise is sexist, mm -hmm. um, it's hyper-violent, yeah. it's consumerist, and so right. on. Yeah. And it's not to say, in doing this sort of popular mining of popular culture, it's not to say we can get everything. Right. right? And that we can, we that everything in popular culture is something that we want to use. It's like, you got to pick and choose, right? right? Um, Another theorist who's been super influential on us in the center um, is uh, this fellow named Stuart Hall. And Stuart Hall uh, is kind of one of the founders of modern cultural studies. Mm -hmm. um, and one of the things I love about Stuart Hall, he wrote an essay called Deconstructing the Popular, in which he was trying to figure out like, how to make sense of the East Enders. And the East Enders, uh, for those of you that are uh, across the pond, know this well, but on this side of the pond, Make me a little explanation. Okay. It's it was a it was soap opera kind of um, yeah. about working class life in East London, and it was stereotyped um, working class people, right? Um, in very sort of predictable ways, and there was a lot to condemn about EastEnders, mm -hmm. and a lot of leftists loved to hate EastEnders. <laughs> Stuart Hall comes along and says, "Okay, that's fine, but you know what? It's a really popular show, and it's really popular." amongst working class people who live in the East End of London. And so for him, it was about like, even if you don't like the show, right? even if there's stuff you don't like in it, it's our responsibility as people who are trying to transform the world to understand that people are getting something out of it. Mm -hmm. And what is that something that they're getting? What is it like that? It's a core DNA element. And then once we can figure that out, then we can actually, you know, work with that. Um, one of his great quotes is probably my all-time favorite is, culture is one of the sites where they struggle for and against a culture of the powerful is engaged. It's why popular culture matters. Otherwise, to tell you the truth, I don't really give a damn about it. Now, I've actually met uh, Stuart Hall, and he actually liked popular culture, but it is such an awesome thing to say, but it's really important because oftentimes when we take people on these trips, they'll be like, I hate this. Yes. Uh, and when we actually took the Muslim American organizer, organizers to Fast and Furious 6, one fellow the next day very seriously said, that was horrible. Mm -hmm. That was horrendous. I really, really, really did not enjoy that. And someone else spoke up, actually Linda Sarsour, mm -hmm. who is now the Linda yeah. Sarsour, said... We got our nails done. With. That's right. <laughs> uh, yeah, we also went to a nail salon together. Uh, uh, we said, she said, you know what? my brothers love it. Um, and if we're going to reach people like my brothers who aren't very political, we've got to understand it. Mm -hmm. We've got to understand it. So this is not about liking the popular culture. Right. Necessarily. Although, I'm, I'm going to make a plug for the Fast and Furious franchise. <laughs> Number eight is coming out. 
Vin Diesel gets taken over. Okay. We'll just leave it at that. Okay. Um, anyway, it's a, it's, a, it's a good one, um, I think. <laughs> uh, and I do like popular culture. You like popular culture. And there's some popular culture I don't like. Oh, please. I hate my son's music. Trying to make me sit through a Tyler Perry movie, exactly. right? Which is it's excruciating for me, but for me to understand why it's so popular, especially popular amongst African American yeah. people, it's I have to watch that in order to glean yeah. right those nuggets of oh, okay, this is yeah. you know this is some of the things that you know was in each one, and I can see you know why this fits into uh, a popular consciousness. Yeah. And I, I like this idea of gleaning nuggets and sort of the idea of like you don't pick the, the I'm going to use this metaphor. Mm -hmm. go with it. You're not picking the crops off the top. You're going down mm -hmm. to what's deep because mm -hmm. sometimes like you know you go see a superhero uh, movie or something like that and you're like yeah how are we going to use this? We're going to wear tights. We're going to be superheroes, <laughs> which is cool, right? Right. You know uh, the Sikh Captain America is one of my favorite um, artistic activists out mm -hmm. there. But it's really not about the surface stuff. It's not right. about the cars. It's not about the girls. It's not about the guns. It's not about the the costumes. Right. It's about the that deep stuff that we were talking about, mm -hmm. about commitment and endurance and the idea of family right. and the multicultural band against the man and things like that. Yeah. Get at that core, and then you don't have to wear types. <laughs> um, so we're going to turn it over. We've got some time here. We're going to turn it over um, the... Uh, I want to ask you some questions about popular yes. culture. Um, by the way, Todd said something I thought was really interesting. I just want to read off here. He said, Sirius does not equal joyless. Ooh. And that is probably the most important <laughs> lesson that. for an activist to learn. <laughs> okay. Hey, guys, what we would like to do is throw up some examples of pop culture um, in, the, in the chat. And let's run with one, and let's just mm -hmm. kind of do this real time with everybody out there. Doesn't have to be popular culture you like, just something you you yeah. know is popular. Lady Gaga, got Steve Lambert, Honey Boo Boo. Oh my gosh, hip hop. Let's see, we're gonna get a whole bunch of the Bachelor. Oh, oh we might want to go. Homeland. Homeland. That's interesting. NFL football. Okay. Take a couple more Kanye Go West. West. <laughs> Kim Kardashian, Game of Game Thrones. Thrones. I've not watched Game of Thrones yet. And yeah, it's 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 yeah, you like it. <laughs> the Apprentice. Ah, the Apprentice. Adult no. Swim. Adult Swim. All right, you're the guest here. Which okay. one are we gonna work with? Well. It because be... of this week, we have to go with The Bachelor. Okay, we have to go with The Bachelor. Okay, so um, for those of the folks out there that know what The Bachelor, can you give a, a brief overview of what The Bachelor is? The Bachelor is the show that... It's reality TV, right? It's reality okay. TV on Channel 7. I think it's on its 33rd season. Mm -hmm. um, it is the show that I know more feminists watch than any other show. And what's, what happens <laughs> on the show? So in the show, and I've only seen one episode, one or two episodes, um, so in the show, and it switches between The Bachelor and The Bachelorette, okay. but in the show, it's a dating show, okay. um, and you're looking for that one and only, okay. right? You're looking for that Cinderella story where you find your maid, and they give you, instead of a shoe, a rose. Got it. And you go over a series of dates with different people. Right. And, and they whittle it down. Got it. It's many like, people it's like Survivor, to but the love version. Exactly. The love version it's of love Survivor. Survivor. <laughs> okay. So, um, that's good. I think uh, probably most people out there are probably more familiar with it than I am, but we got an overview. Now, the first thing we want to think about is, like, what needs and desires are being met? by mm -hmm. something. So that's a question to everybody out there in webinar land. Okay. Um, what needs are being met by a show like The Bachelor? Mm -hmm. I love competition. Gossip. That's a good one. Mm. Gossip. Yeah, there's something about all shows that are around gossip 
which is this notion of like you know something mm -hmm. and that idea of like the importance of knowledge yeah. and the mastery of knowledge and like you know the backstory of something. Right. So common disdain. <laughs> <laughs> oh. Now, and Martin, give us a little bit more about common disdain, because I could take this in a direction, but I'm not sure it's okay. the direction which Martin wants to take it. Any other sort of desires? Like, why do people watch this show over and over? To judge the characters. Ah, yes. The characters being human beings. Yes. 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 <laughs> yes. There's this notion that you can sit in judgment of folks. Yes. Yes. Right. And feel superior, yeah. right? Because you're not doing, you're not embarrassing yourself like that. Um, and you are, yeah, you're put in the seat of being the judge and jury alongside the whoever the bachelor or bachelorette is. Mm -hmm. I'm a big fan of the voice because I get to do it. Ah, and that's and uh, Katerina, but makes viewers feel better because mm -hmm. that's part of the judgment too. Yes, right? which is like I would never do something like that. Right. Um, and I think part of reality TV in general is based on the idea of uh, Martin had that idea of what did he, what did he call it back up there disdain mm -hmm. and this idea of uh, making viewers feel better about mm -hmm. themselves. Laura, ah, hey Laura. Mm -hmm. uh, Address a common desire. Right. Yeah. I mean, love is like the most common thing we have. We all want it. We've all had it. We've all right. had our heart broken. Right. That is, it's not an idiosyncratic, True. hard to access desire. It is the most base desire. The other one being survivor. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> it's like Freud run amok. Right. You know, you have Eros and Thanatos. Just love and death. Right. In death. Okay. Um, and in addition to the love, it's the romance, right? Yeah. It's the each episode is about going to a place, right? It, it's an advertisement for the place that they're going to, yeah. but each is a destination, right? So uh, you get people who are having these experiences, yeah. and you get to see them, right? So even as you're judging them, you're like, wow, they got to go to blah, blah, right. blah, and they, right? and they get to go to you know, Disneyland or whatever and have it just for themselves, right? Yeah. And you get to see that incredible experience. Well, and it's, and it's, well, it's like romance novels. Romance mm -hmm. novels... Part of the attraction of romance novels is they take place in exotic times and places, right? right? And then you get to travel them. There's some other, a lot of them, they're coming fast and furious now, okay? <laughs> um, it's like, sort of like watching a car crash uh, in some ways. Yeah. <laughs> was that Fast and Furious <laughs> or The Bachelor? <laughs> <laughs> uh, Todd says the drama of sport. You don't know what will happen. The idea of anticipation, uh, yes. who's going to win to be right. Like, I knew he would pick the sexy woman. Yes. Leslie wrote that. Um, Martin, but also to root for the underdogs and the nicer oh, characters. Oh, that's yes. true. Martin, question. Does this apply to the news and how many people view politicians and public figures? Martin, that's where we're going right now. <laughs> okay? So what we do, and when we do this as a yeah. workshop, is we spend about 20 or 30 minutes sort of unpacking, like mm -hmm. observing what did you see amongst other people that were watching this or participating with this, and what did you feel yourself? Mm -hmm. And then, then, then we go move to the other part, um, the last part, which is, how can we address these in our work? As artistic activists, how do we actually deal productively with some of these desires, these needs, mm -hmm. some of which are kind of ugly desires to sit in judgment of people, right? <laughs> um, but how do we, to go back to William James's point, how do we, or his phrase, how do we move the point? How do we right. move this elsewhere? So that's what we're going to ask you right now out there in webinar land. Um, how do we actually use some of these insights what we can learn from something like The Bachelor mm -hmm. in our own artistic activist work. A lot of people seem the first stuff that's come up is really about not how we use it, but understanding the appeal of Donald Trump mm. and other politicians. <laughs> um, this is something that both Orlando and Martin sort of touch upon, right? right? And has Donald, is this what Donald Trump understands in a way? Is that the game he's playing is the game of reality TV? I don't know who I'm going to pick this week. Right. It may be you. Is that what our Supreme Court just it, it, Exactly. Yeah. It may be someone else. Mm -hmm. um, 
high drama. It's like watching a car crash <laughs> over and over. Every day it's like a car crash. And now we sit back and are like, oh, man, this is going to bring him down. Well, for someone who's trained in reality TV, as right. he does, he understands this is what car crashes are. People love to watch. Mm -hmm. He is entertaining. Right. This is first hundred days. He hasn't gotten shit done, right? right. Um, for the first 30 days of it. Um, feels like a hundred days. A hundred days. Feels like three years. <laughs> but boy, has it been entertaining. Yes. Uh, he's what everybody's talking about. Mm -hmm. He also gets that, right, especially as a reality TV star, is that he's appealing to a niche. So he's not a politician trying to appeal to poll numbers. He's like, I have an audience. Yeah. I'm going to serve my audience. I'm going to make my audience seem bigger than what they are. Yeah. And that's what he keeps doing. So he knows who he's talking to, yeah. and he's not talking to the American people. No. No, it might come and bite him in the ass. Yeah, at some point. it, it um, could, but he's working niche yeah. audience, and yep. that's been fascinating to yeah. watch. But you're right. that yeah, If you think about reality TV coming about at the moment when cable comes about, you mm -hmm. don't need an audience share larger than 15 or 20%. Exactly. That's the world he understands. Right. Yeah. Um, so let's moving away from critique. Mm -hmm. How do we, and this is a tough one, i got to say, no, no ideas are coming immediately to mind. How do we use some of these ideas in our own work? Like, one of the ideas out there was, we don't know what's going to happen. It's like a sport, mm -hmm. and we can root for the underdog. Is there a way that we can think about, as artistic activists, that we can build some of that into our work? I'm going to come back to what Martin said in this Yeah. Part. Oh, we're staying with Trump, man. <laughs> okay, so we're just going to stay this on. Uh, uh, we're going to keep right. it. Um, there's a whole bunch of interesting stuff coming up, which is <laughs> if Trump is playing reality TV, mm -hmm. then how do we make him boring, Martin says. Mm -hmm. Okay? How do we, if the, the rules of the game of reality TV are about drama, how do we remove drama? That is a great question. All right, so, so far, we've been spending a lot of time up in comedy, mm -hmm. right, within everything that is going on. Um, and then there's the fear. That's also, right, so we have that anticipation and the fear that's happening. But how do we remove drama um, from this? And Le I, Leslie has. <laughs> Leslie's got a okay. idea. Uh, we need to create a more flamboyant character with a better show. Well, okay, so now we're back in the positive thing. Okay. Which is, why was the Women's March so phenomenally successful? With the pussy hats. Yes. It was a flamboyant show, which was far more popular. You know, if we don't think about a character as an individual, yeah. right? Because that's kind of fascistic, right? Right. We don't want our great man or great woman. I love Elizabeth Warren. I don't want to have the same sort of adulation for a character. Right. That's, not, that's not a democratic politics. But you can have a movement. Black Panthers. And? Just how, <laughs> how cool and flamboyant <laughs> and awesome were the Black Panthers. Very. Right. I mean, it's just like Angela Davis, coolest person in yes. the room. Okay? You know, it just, you looked at her and you were like, wow. Kathleen Cleaver, coolest person in the room. Right. Okay. Now, it led to some bad places in some ways, but it, we can start thinking about how does a movement become flamboyant. Um, yes. I remember going to my first ACT UP meeting and then mm -hmm. my first ACT UP protest, and the flamboyance of ACT UP was what drew me into that. Right. And it made me realize that politics can be flamboyant. Mm -hmm. It can be dramatic. Right. And I love that also because it's, and I think that's where our strength is, is looking at flamboyancy of movement rather than individual, mm -hmm. right? The individuals will be, you know, highlighted and picked up, but we need to be thinking about how to make our movements more, um, to stand out more. And I think a lot of times we shy away you know, or undercut because we don't like this idea of someone becoming famous, yeah. right? It's just mm -hmm. like, why Gloria Steinem when there were thousands of women who were, you know, participating, yeah. right? But it's just the movement. How do you use that celebrity in order to build up something that's larger mm -hmm. than what the individual is, right? Because 
once Donald Trump, Donald Trump is not building a movement, right? He talks about, you know, this unseen America, but once he's removed, there's nothing there, mm -hmm. right, um, that he can even pass the, the mantle to. Um, but how do you make the movement become more exciting than, you know, whatever that competition is? Mm -hmm. Let's uh, yeah. let's think about that, okay? Um, Katrina says, how do we make people feel empowered, bigger than themselves? Um, too much drama devolves to fatigue. Yes, for sure. Um, but this is something we want to leave us with, which is this, again, we could keep doing this for... Mm -hmm. We love doing this. Yeah. Exactly. Um, and this is something you could think about doing with your friends because it's the greatest thing to do with fellow activists is give yourself permission to go get your nails done. <laughs> give yourself permission to go see a hit movie. Give yourself permission to go to a gun range if you want to go to a right. gun range and think about it as homework. That you're actually not just going to get your nails done. Right. You're not going to see a blockbuster film. Right. You're not listening to Top 40. Um, you're doing homework. Right. For the cause. Don't be detached. Yeah. Go into it. Yeah. You know, dive into it, feel it, get the experience. Mm -hmm. But look at what what's going around. Why is this spot? Why is this crowded? And my meetings aren't. Why is this? You know, yes. <laughs> why are people here instead of? And ask that question, and that'll help you pull out what it is that's drawing them. Yeah, excellent. Um, and just we're getting that time. Oh. I know. <laughs> uh, and I just want to say, one, it's been great having Pat here. Um, and two, we have more webinars coming up. <laughs> Next one is going to be making your meetings inventive, creative, lively. Right. Very much. <laughs> I was just saying, and we're going to add flamboyance <laughs> into there. But it's going to be about creative brainstorming yeah. um, and how to actually do the creative brainstorming. Because as creative people, that's our strength, but often right. meetings stifle that. And so this is kind of a way to think about how do we make our meetings more creative, very practical. That's a um, and that's going to be next Friday. The Friday after that, interestingly enough, we're going to have a Hollywood screenwriter on to talk, and an ex-activist, to talk about how do we make Trump boring, about how do we make the Trump, the, the Trump show jump the shark. <laughs> and his name is Jason Grote, and he's going to lead us through what makes a hit show, what makes a bomb, and where we can go. <laughs> We've got lots of them lined up in the future. Um, as always, these are free. We are, they're always going to be free no matter what. Um, but we don't budget for them. This kind of just came out of our need to do something. If you have a fair, some bucks you want to spend, it, give it to us. Um, <laughs> it's a tax write-off. Keep so this going. Keep this going. But most importantly, the most important thing is to come back and share this, yeah. okay? We have many more people actually seeing this and downloading it afterwards than, um, than actually are watching it, which actually makes us feel really good, although we want people here because the interaction is super important. So you're going to be getting an email um, in the next 24 hours that's going to have a link to the recording and all of that sort of stuff. And um, share it with your friends. Bring them along. This is open to everybody. It's free for everybody. And yeah. That's it. So, Pat, final words to close with? Final words, understand and appreciate that pop culture is a tool that you can use, and there are lessons, so many lessons to be uh, taken from what is out there. And consider it your role uh, and a gift that you can do to the movement and the issues that you care about by making them more popular. Awesome. Thank you, Beth. Thank you. See you later. <laughs>